These are the rich silver mines of Diego, a historic source of wealth in an amazing country, the Dominican Republic, Trujillo's empire. We're going to take you there. I'm Bill Bird. The program is Treasure, and our story is a fascinating tale of treasure and buccaneers that takes place in the private domain of the famous dictator Trujillo, the dictator of the Dominican Republic, who has an equally famous son who made quite a splash in Hollywood. Well, many people have never heard of uh, the country of the Dominican Republic. It's most colorful, and it has a fascinating history of wealth. Wealth that goes back to the days of Christopher Columbus, and the silver mines of Diego located in the Sierra Madre Mountains of the Dominican Republic itself. Now, here in this blow-up, you can see that the Spanish would smelt the silver into bars, then transport it by burrow down the back road from Samana, where eventually it was shipped to Spain. A very convenient arrangement, except for one thing. The ever-present danger from the jungle and the buccaneers, who would swoop down, capture the silver, cart it through this hidden cave in the jungle, to the sea and their waiting ships. centuries ago, a quiet path through the jungle, a young soldier named Carlos doing his everyday job of guarding a small fortune in silver. The jungle surrounding was just so many trees and vines to Carlos because his mind was on other things. A dark-eyed girl waiting in the small village he called home. A tall, cool tankard of ale to be shared in the tavern. And the quiet walk home in the moonlight. Yes, those were the things that occupied his thoughts on that afternoon in old San Domingo. And so they travel on, on with their suit, unaware of their fate. deeper and deeper into the trap. We'll rest here, said Carlos. After all, we have plenty of time. No hurry, he said. But for Carlos, there was no more time. And that night, in a little tavern, a dark-eyed girl would wait for a soldier named Carlos, who'd been chosen to die. The prize in this game, gleaming bars of silver looted by the buccaneers, a ruthless horde of men who'd slit your throat for a bag of gold coins or a burrow laden with silver bars. Treacherous men who knew the jungle and the sea coast well, who had a secret passage to the sea, a passage that was a thorn in the side of the proud Spaniards, because despite all their efforts, they were never able to find it, never able to find the pirate's passage, the secret of the Buccaneers. And now I want you to meet the man we sent to Trujillo's domain, the Dominican Republic. He is, of course, Commander Ian Murray. Commander, since the Dominican Republic is a dictatorship, did you have any difficulty in making this picture? Well, yes, we did, Bill, the first couple of days. But after that, we had complete government cooperation, and although we were watched everywhere we went, we got through. Commander, just exactly what were you looking for? Well, primarily, Bill, two things. The first was the rediscovery 
of the locale of the first silver mines in the New World, the silver mines of Diego. And the second and perhaps most important was the hoping to find this pirate's passage, the secret cave which had baffled the Spanish authorities for so many centuries. And where did you begin your journey, Commander? We started our journey at the capital city of the Dominican Republic, Suidad Trujillo. This was the city of Columbus. Here he founded the city in 1496 and is buried within this cathedral. This, you might say, is the modern city built, which has been brought up to a very high degree of efficiency by uh, Trujillo and his government, and perhaps one of the most attractive places in the Mediterranean. But we had another object in coming here. It was to try and find out definite clues which would lead us to the solving of our several riddles. We made our headquarters at this hotel, and it was rather surprising to find such a, a beautiful edifice in this part of the world. And from here, we interviewed various people, and then traveled slightly north to this lagoon, where Columbus's ships had anchored. And here, Bill, is the famous yacht of the Generalissimo Trujillo himself. Mm the first church built in the New World. And following the clues uh, reference to the mines of Diego, we visited this Franciscan monastery because the silver from these mines had helped to build this magnificent building. Commander, there's no question it is a magnificent building. Uh, how long ago was it uh, built? Well, it was built in 1541, but it was sacked by the famous buccaneer Francis Drake in 1575, and they say there's a curse on it because it's been left in the original condition which he left it those many centuries ago. Commander, traveling through the Dominican Republic must have been an experience in itself. Where else did you, where else did you go? Well, we went to see the old walls of the original city, and this particular building is extremely interesting because here lived the son of the great Columbus himself, Diego, the man whose mines we were trying to find. In this building, the man who actually owned the silver mines once lived, is that correct? He lived and was viceroy of the island under the kingdom of Spain. Much of the wealth of the state of San Domingo today, Bill, is in sugar. As we passed up country on our search, we passed many, many places which had a definite bearing on the early story of the country. One of these was this well, the first in the New World, which was built as early as 1497. It's almost as if we're watching a living history book, Commander, and in the empire of Trujillo, one can still see it today. It's an amazing thing that so many of these things are preserved for modern people to see after all these ages. Continuing, we were told to visit this particular locale which has rather a peculiar story behind it because it affects one man who was very prominent in the story of the, that portion of America south of where we live in the United States. This fort had been built by Hernando Cortez, the future conqueror of Mexico, because at this time he was the military commander of this area. Commander, it's a fascinating thing that this country we're in, the Dominican Republic, apparently spawns men of great stature and uh, interesting stature, to say the least. Well, it must be realized that from this island began the future expansion of the Western, uh, the New World and the Western Hemisphere. Very strange looking fort, uh, Commander, could you explain the... It's rather noticeable that these particular oubliettes or uh, indentations in the wall were not made for cannon, but from their shape for the use of the arquebus and the handgun. This definitely places the date somewhere around the very early years of the 16th century. What, were the mines in operation at that time, the silver mines? This was built possibly with a view to protecting the miners and their holdings in this particular area. And it's an odd thing that when you figure that 150 men in their heavy clothing could be crammed inside this fort. It was rather an amazing thing. And close by were the remains of the great hall of the residence of Fernando Cortez himself. Does Trujillo, uh, the dictator, try to keep these uh, ruins in any state of preservation? That is one point in which he's very, uh, very much interested. He desires that these should be preserved for posterity. Journeying further up country, he came to the old capital of the island, Santiago. 
This is a city which lies in a tremendous valley, beautifully located, and is really a lovely little city. From Santiagoville, where we had received certain information, we proceeded north into the mountains of the Sierra Madre del Norte. And under the uh, information obtained from this guide, we reached a point in the hills where we had to climb to a certain eminence. And I imagine by now you and Jean McCabe were beginning to get a little excited at the fact that you were getting close to the silver mines. Did he know that they existed in this area? He did, and uh, Jean and I were not only excited, but I tell you, the, the weather and the atmosphere didn't help very much. It was pretty hot. Well, I, I was going to ask you to describe to our audience, Commander, just exactly the conditions you were climbing up country under. Well, in this type of clothing, Bill, traveling in a dense jungle at a temperature of 110 degrees is not very pleasant. Of course, it was a climb up all the time, and we didn't know what we'd encounter on the way. Are there animals in, in, in the Dominican Republic, in, in, in the jungle? Fortunately, only a few wild pigs and very, very few venomous snakes. But the way was tricky, and at times we had to chop our way, actually, through the dense undergrowth. Well, there was no real danger, I, I suppose. No personal danger from uh, snakes or animals. The danger was that this trail, which was very remote, sometimes presented difficulties which we didn't expect. I see what you mean, Commander. That was a nasty fall. And at the same time, Bill, you must realize we're climbing gradually up because now we're at an altitude of approximately 4,000 feet. Every foot of the way, Bill, gave us a little bit of a thrill because we felt at the end of this climb, we were going to see something and find out something which we've come a long way to do. Then at last we reached the crest, one of the highest points in the San Dominican Republic. And the guide told us that from here, by using field glasses, we could actually see the remnants of the fabulous mines of Diego Colon. And there, Bill, against the hillside, were the remains of the shafts and the tailings of these mines, which have been unused now for a period of over three centuries. And these, Commander, were the first silver mines in the, in the Americas? These were the first silver mines in the New World, controlled by the son of the man who had found the New World, Diego Colon. The first half, then, of our treasured tale has been proven. The mines existed. And this was the source of the wealth of silver that the Spanish took down that long jungle trail. In spite of the heat and the climb, we had accomplished what we set out to do. And then we turned face and went south. We endeavored to follow the trail the Spanish had used to transport their silver. And we passed several of these cattle, which were the original buccaneer cattle. And then we arrived at the town of La Romana, it was most essential that we should try and find some definite information here because this was presumed to be near the site of our second goal, the famous Pirate's Passage. Commander, I don't like to digress from our treasure tale itself, but how did you find the people of the Dominican Republic who live under uh, the Trujillo dictatorship? Well, on the whole, Bill, they were very friendly, but shall I say, as we had uh, a government guide with us, uh, they weren't too particular in saying too much. But they were cooperative to a degree, and some of them had a slight inkling of the story. This is your friendly guide? <laughs> this is our friendly guide, and I use that term rather loosely. Had the people any knowledge of the Pirate's Passage or this cave that you were looking for? Uh, basically, no, Bill. But, uh, of course, the legend had persisted to such a degree that they had a slight inkling of it. Probably. Owing to the fact that we had a government car and a government guide, perhaps they were afraid to say too much. I can imagine that. Pursuing our journey, in our second quest, we passed this lagoon. And this in the old days, Bill, was a very, very valuable place. 
into which the ships of the buccaneers came and anchored. And then, down at the extreme southeastern portion of the island, we had been told that an old gentleman there, who would probably meet us, would give us some information. And Bill, this is the strange point. He spoke to us in perfect English. Well, that is strange, Commander. Uh, had he been born somewhere uh, in the United States? This man is a real character. He had been born in the Virgin Islands and for 57 years had lived in this one spot on this island of, Sa of uh, San Domingo. Well, if he were born in the Virgin Islands, then he would be an American citizen. He is an American citizen, and he had a little American flag which he showed us. But the important thing, Bill, was that this man knew one of three persons who could conduct us to the secret entrance to the cave which we hoped would prove to be Pirate's Passage. This is the entrance to the lagoon of Boca Chavon. In the old days, it was deep enough for the buccaneer ships to enter. They would come in here, drop their anchors, get their crews ashore, and then prey on the silver trains that the Spanish sent down from the north. This old gentleman, whose name was Charlie, was very cooperative. Of course, he was interested in our search, but at the same time, he was a little more interested in the fact that we are from the USA. And he made one request, Bill. Oh? He said, I've been here 57 years, and I have one particular ambition, and that's to return to my native land and die where I can die a free man. Commander, that's quite a story. Uh, how much would it take for him to get back? It would take the large sum of about $60. Well, maybe we can arrange that. Where are you going now, Commander? We're going across to the small village of Siobhan, which lies on the opposite side of the lagoon. And uh, we hoped here, as we had been told, that Charlie would live up to his agreement or his promise and introduce us to this gentleman who would lead us to the unfathomed story so far of Pirate's Passage. And here he is, Jose, 92 years of age. Apparently he and Charlie the, were great friends, Bill. I was going to say, apparently the climate of the, the Dominican Republic is good for longevity, Commander. <laughs> well, it proved so in this case, because he told us at the start we'd have to travel possibly a kilometer up into the jungle. Well, it turned out to be about four. And of course, at times, the old gentleman, tired, we stopped to discuss matters, and you... then he carried and led us on. Passing land crabs, which are not very friendly if disturbed. This tree is curious, Bill, because it contains a practical myriad of weaver birds' nests, which are particular, of course, to the area. All the time, forging our way through a somewhat dense jungle, at last, out of nowhere, came this cave entrance. Gene and I were completely thrilled because we didn't know whether or not this was the secret to Pirate's Passage, but we hoped so. Once we got inside, Jose, who was very superstitious, would only go a certain distance. And he said, no, I wouldn't go any further. If you want to go, go. For two hours underground, using flares, we followed the trail, led through this cave, and came out of all places on the sea coast, nearly two and a half miles away from where we'd started. Commander, this certainly then fits the description that you'd heard of Pirate's Passage. It fitted the description perfectly, but still we weren't too sure because there are many caves in this area. But along the beach, a lonely place, we spotted something. We didn't know what it was. Possibly it would give us some sort of a clue. But there in front of us, there were just the remains of a dead dolphin. The only remains of a living thing outside of ourselves that was in this particular area at the time. The sea, of course, holds many mysteries, Commander. How could you possibly prove that the passage or cave you'd come through was the original pirate's passage? 
Well, we had been uh, asked or told to visit a gentleman who lived further up the coast in a little resort called Boca Chica. This particular party, a retired naval officer, had built himself a little domain on an island just off the coast. And he had spent all of his retired life, Bill, in investigating the stories of the pirates and the buccaneers, and in particular, the story of the fabulous pirate's passage. He appears to be rather friendly uh, upon well, arrival. Well, he was an ex-Englishman, and of course I was a Scotsman, but we, for the moment we buried the hatchet, and uh, you might say got down to facts. He was extremely helpful, and of course he wished to show us this small domain that he'd built for himself out of a mangrove swamp. It must have been rather fascinating to find him find a man with an island of his own. It was, because apart from the fact that he built the island, he'd also put wire up. And within the area, of course, the tides provided the water from day to day. He even put Mako sharks to protect his possessions. All sorts of sea life also, probably the uh, future source of turtle soup, the hawk-eyed turtle. He'd gone into his project with some thought, and of course, it was more or less isolated, and apparently he was thoroughly enjoying himself. And also, his other diversion was the important one, as I've told you, to investigating the early stories of the buccaneers, the pirates, and of two of the Indians of the island. What are those, Commander? Well, he had these iguana lizards, which he had their particular purpose, because they're a very, very good source of food, Bill. Tastes like chicken. Oh, you're kidding. The buccaneers were very fond of them. Well, by now, you had gotten fairly well acquainted and admired all of his pets, Commander. Were you able to get any, any information from him? Yes, one thing had led to another, and then we started discussing in detail the uh, trip that we'd made through this particular cave, and then he suddenly said, wait, said, wait a minute, I've got something I want to show you. He sent his boy for this. It was a skull and leg bones. He had found this skull along with some arms of the period of the, of the early 16th century in the identical cave through which we had passed. And Bill, this was a terrific thrill because he practically assured us beyond any shadow of a doubt that we had rediscovered the fabulous Pirate Passage of San Domingo. And perhaps as a fitting climax to this story, what could be more applicable than the skull and the crossbones of an actual buccaneer who had died in Pirate's Passage. Well, Commander, what about any pirate loot that might have been found in the passage to the sea? Well, Bill, our English naval friend, like so many of his fellow countrymen, was just a little bit reticent. And whether or not he found more than he cared to disclose, we just don't know. But there is one thing for certain. We had found the fabulous pirate's passage. And it's more than possible that in their attempts to escape at times, they left silver, these buccaneers, in this cave. Whether it's there or not, that's a matter for future exploration. Well, thanks very much, Commander. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. A treasure tale of Spanish silver. An ambush in the jungle. And a secret pirate's passage to the sea. Until we meet once again to tell you another tale of treasure. This is Bill Bird saying goodbye and good hunting.